it's like I've got two little humans constantly conspiring against me to create chaos <laughs> everywhere, no matter how hard I try to counter it. All right. When I there saw the is. you're not in the room yet message, I was like straightening up around the office. I've got a four-year-old, so there were like Legos and toys and all kinds of things in here. That she Why straighten to. up? Maybe we wanted to see the Legos and the four-year-old. Well, the four-year-old is at grandma's house and the housekeepers are coming at one o'clock, which is why I was straightening up. Got it. I would hate for any of his Lego blocks to get lost forever in the vacuum cleaner. Well, we're already recording. So just FYI, the, 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 you just made me think of something. Isn't it funny how we clean up for the cleaning people? Oh my gosh. Yes. I, like every week. Well, every two weeks, but I think that's like what having kids is right. Like you just, it's like, I've got two little humans constantly conspiring against me to create chaos <laughs> everywhere, no matter how hard I try to counter it. How, <laughs> how old are your kids? You said one's four. Yeah, he's about to turn five, and then my little guy is two. So it's just like all chaos all the time. Well, have fun. The chaos changes when they get older. It's still chaos. It's just a different kind of chaos. How old are yours? 22 and 19. Okay, and there's still yeah. chaos. Wow. It's just, a different kind, it's just a different kind of chaos. You know, you think, maybe I'm doing it wrong, Brittany. I'm, I'm maybe, <laughs> there's no parenting manual, right? They don't leave. You don't get this thing when you leave the hospital, but the, my kids are great by the way. And my wife is the best and she's the best mom ever. But as I always thought that as I got older, the chaos would decrease and, and you'd be able to take things off of your plate. I don't think you actually take them off. It's just what's on it. Actually, it just changes. Like mm -hmm. you never stop worrying. You never stop trying to get involved you'll see but i don't have legos laying all over the house though i will say that <laughs> small victories <laughs> if it's a victory i kind of miss legos maybe i should bring them back they're in the attic somewhere well Brittany hodak thank you for jumping on the walk podcast i i should the, the the way that i do this clearly we're not exactly like the most professional production crew here and 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 my my buddy thomas sealbinder who is um you know, the two of us have a day job. We, uh, we, we, we're helping to continue to build and run a, a technology solution. Um, but years ago, and, and a leader in the industry that we support said, you know, you ought to record some of these conversations. They're kind of cool when you learn about someone's wins and losses and their background. And so we, we got a camera and a microphone and we started doing it. And we've been fortunate enough to have a, a, some relatively influential people jump on and, and have some fun. You and I got introduced at, a, at an event in Nashville not that long ago. And um, immediately, I, I, boy, I sure would love to have you on the podcast if, if you're willing to do it. And so thanks for jumping in. Yeah, I don't normally just do an intro, but maybe give like a 30 second rundown of what you do. And then, man, I don't know where to start because there's so many cool things we can talk about, but g give a quick rundown. Sure. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. My name is Brittany Hodak. I am obsessed with creating super fans, which are essentially just customers who create more customers. I grew up working in the entertainment industry. Uh, when I say grow up, I literally got my first job when I was 16 as a radio station mascot. And I kind of worked my way up the ranks through there, worked for several record companies and media conglomerates and um, you know, a lot of fun stuff on both coasts. And I started my own entertainment company in, gosh, I think it was like late 2010, early 2011, grew it up to an eight figure business, had the opportunity to work with some of the biggest superstars on the planet because my first corporate partner was Walmart. So we were helping them launch all kinds of entertainment products and the music and movies and sports spaces. So that was a ton of fun somewhere along the way. We got a call one day from Shark Tank saying, hey, you guys look awesome. You should be on the show. And I thought, well, that sounds like fun. We should do that. So I went on Shark Tank, had a really good visit in the tank. I uh, got offers from four of the five sharks. And at the time, I think we were the highest valued company 
ever for female entrepreneurs. And so that led to a lot of consulting requests and a lot of speaking requests. And somewhere along the way, I was like, man, being on stage is fun. I really like this. This is great. So in 2019, I sold the majority of my equity in that entertainment company, the super fan company, so that I could do more speaking and traveling around and getting to talk about what I love the most, which is creating super fans. And I have a book by that same name that will be out on January 10th. So it's already available for pre-order at Barnes and Noble and Amazon and all the great indie bookstores across the country. And I hope you'll check it out. Well, I, for one, will check it out. The, and, and thank you for that because, you know, I was messing around on your bio and, and then I know some people that know you. So I was sort of asking around and, and I, I was like, this could be five, you know, we, we generally run for 40, 45 minutes, right? Um, this could be five episodes because we, we call this the walk podcast because I really like for the environment to be like just two people going for a walk and just let's see what you talk about. We might not talk about anything that's industry related. There's no telling where it can go. And if you go back and look at some of our episodes, it, it's, it's certainly true. Um, when I was looking at your bio though, it sort of made me think about, um, gosh, I can't remember the name of the movie. What was the, that movie that was about the, the young kid that was a writer for Rolling Stone that went on tour with that fictitious band? Almost you know what I'm talking famous. About. It, it made me think of Almost Famous, like sort of watching your, your life and your bio unfold. It's what it felt like. Do you think that's a, a, a fair description? I mean, obviously you weren't a writer for Rolling Stone, but kind of similar. Well, yeah. So I had the good fortune that my maiden name was Brittany Jones. And I'd been working at the radio station for about six months. And the promotions manager said, you know, I keep seeing ads on TV for this Bridget Jones movie. We need to do something with you because we've got a Brittany Jones. So what could we do and call it Brittany Jones Diary? Now, mind you, no one outside of Roland High School knew that the radio station had a Brittany Jones because I wore the bee suit. Like that was literally all I did was was because you were the mascot. Mask yeah. Right. Um, but with all the, you know, kind of bravado of a 17 year old with nothing to lose, I was like, well, you know, you're always talking about the website. What if I just interviewed all the bands that came to town and we could call that my diary, like, you know, see what happens when Brittany went bowling with Blink-182 or whatever. And, and you, 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 not to interrupt you, but you, you were in Oklahoma. Is that right? I was in Oklahoma. Yeah. Okay. So I grew up right on the state line. The radio station that I worked with was in Fort Smith, Arkansas, but it was part of what is now iHeart, what was then Clear Channel. So what was really cool is that we had all these sister stations everywhere. And once I started writing content, they started syndicating the content to other markets. So like mm -hmm. if I went to go see a show in Dallas or Oklahoma city or little rock or whatever, uh, the stations would just syndicate that. So it was, it was really cool. Um, so when I kind of pitched that idea, the promotions manager said exactly what you just said. Oh, that sounds like that other movie. I keep seeing ads for this almost famous movie. Why don't we call it Brittany Jones diary, but we'll make all of the imagery look like that almost famous movie. And I was like, done. And so at 17, it literally was my job to hang out with rock stars and brag about it on the internet. Like that is what I got paid to do when I was in high school. And so I kept that going as long as I could. I, you know, even when I went to college, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't stop working at the station. I want to do this. I have to be able to continue to have this hookup for all of these tickets and all these fun experiences. So that was my introduction to the entertainment industry. Okay, so I have to ask, you, you got to give us some rock star stories. I mean, you probably have a treasure trove. I mean, what, what is... I, I just want to know, not to interrupt you. I knew Thomas was going to be jumping in. I just want to know, did you actually go bowling with Blink-182 or was that just kind of like a metaphor? No, I did. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> because well, they and played... What was, and they, what was their scores? Do you remember? Is Travis the worst? <laughs> um... <laughs> We were all just kind of having fun. I don't think we actually finished the whole frame. They were playing at this venue called um, Bronco Bowl in Dallas, uh, which was like an amphitheater attached to a bowling alley. And it was kind of like, a, like Dave and Buster's -y type like place. Um, but yeah, we did. That was back in probably like, I don't know, 2000 or something. Uh, I know so I was, was like not a very good Travis. bowler. I was really nervous. I was like practicing leading up to that. Um, <laughs> I bet. But yeah, it was funny, like, so this was before blogging was like a word people used. Right. And so nobody really knew. Plus I was a kid, you know, like I had braces, like I was 17. And so nobody really like knew 
how to react. Um, like some of the bands, everybody was like so nice. Um, but some of the bands were acting like it was like a really big deal. Like they were treating me the way they would be treating a real journalist or they were so excited because nobody was like putting interviews online at this point. Like mm -hmm. even like Spin and Rolling Stone, it, they were all like, you know, buy our magazine, buy our magazine. So there wasn't much content online. So when I would write something, and of course it was always really positive and flattering and like usually funny because there was like always something funny that would happen they would start sharing the links to the stories because there was literally nothing else to share like there was nothing else online like very little content tv stations weren't even like streaming their video content yet because you know most people i don't know most people but a lot of people still had dial up back in the days so you know i would put together these really fun stories with pictures and you know talk about the new album or the new single or whatever and so i started having all of these publicists from New York and LA reach out to me and like pitch me on meeting their bands when their bands came to town and they would be like oh you know we're not gonna be in Fort Smith but we've got a show in Little Rock or we've got a show in Fayetteville or like we'll have passes waiting for you in Tulsa and you can come see the band before or after the show um, so it's just really funny because I like when I started getting these invitations to meet with bands in other cities like my parents wouldn't let me drive there. So I had to get my older brother or someone to take me because they were like, we're not letting you drive five hours to Dallas. No way. So it was really funny. Did the publicists and those calling you, did they know that you were a 17 year old with braces? Like, did they um, even know who this person not. was? Yeah, no, I bet. A lot of them. And then once they did, everybody was like, oh, it's like almost famous. This is so fun. Come hang out on our bus. Like it was just such an interesting time. And because, so the radio station I worked for was a pop radio station, but our sister stations in the same building were country and classic rock. So pretty much like any artist that came to town, I would go and create content and they would just like also put it on the country station or also put it on the classic rock station. So it was just a really fun experience that I feel like doesn't even sound real looking back on it. I'm like, oh, this totally sounds like like a, it's a bad dream. 80s movie but no that was that was my that was my life oh, I don't think it's a bad 80s movie it's like a it's like a dream what are you talking about the, 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 <laughs> okay I, I want to ask the question because I, I have to what were some of the the bands that you loved hanging out with the most were the ones that surprised you where you're like I'm not like sure if I'm gonna like these people and then you just fell in love with them yeah I mean there were so many great bands um, like I said, most people were really nice to me. There were a few people that were jerks. Um, what was really great, like there were a few bands who, you know, I'd say, and especially like as I got older, when it was like, oh, I'm in college, I'm trying to decide like if I want to record a record label or if I want to work in a music magazine. There were so many people who were like, oh, like I'm sure I can get you an internship at our label. Like, do you want me to make a call? Or, oh, like have you thought about what department you're going to work in? Like, let's talk about the different departments. So I learned about the music industry from artists who were like very benevolently like, here's what I wish I knew when I was 18 and was thinking yeah. about getting into this business. So, right. and then when I launched my own entertainment company, when I was 27, it was sort of like a continuation of that because I'd written the business plan for the company when I was like 19 years old and I just could never get any traction. Like everybody was like, Oh, that's a cute idea. Now like go back to your desk and do your job. And so <laughs> it took me finally launching my own company to get to sort of, say I told you so in, in some ways of like see I knew this would work and then I got to work with you know just like my idols like I got to work with Dolly and Kiss and George Strait and like every huge pop star on the planet you know Katy Perry and Taylor Swift and Justin Bieber and just you know everyone and it was so fun because in that scenario like all of a sudden I was the CEO um, so it wasn't, it was like a nice little, you know, and, and it was, I was 27 when I started the company. So it was like 10 years from interning artists and trying to like talk my way backstage for shows where I didn't have backstage access to then being able to say like, okay, well, let me tell you about this 
million dollar deal I brokered for you at Walmart. And here are the brands that are involved and here's the product we're making and here's what I need from you. And getting to work with them like as a creative partner on these really cool, um, you know, memorabilia pieces. Yeah, wow. Um, I I, I got a couple of questions, but I want to back up a little bit. Okay. I mean, you were clearly not a normal child. <laughs> I don't know if you know that, but and I don't know. I mean, Thomas has little kids. I have big kids. Um, I mean, either were your parents like this? Like, did you have some, what was your internal motivation? You know, I'm looking at pictures of you on your bio and, and you know, you were a, you were a brand girl long before maybe you even knew what that was. Like I see the, 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 you know, you're wearing the hat and the t-shirt on your bio and you, you clearly had this drive towards, towards branding, but then to even think that you could do this thing at 17 years old. And then to your point, even at 27, which now you've matured, you've got, you went through college, but go back. Like, was there something early on that was the catalyst for you to sort of become this person? You know, I think, I just always kind of had the attitude of why not? I grew up in a really small town in Oklahoma. I knew from like a really young age that I wanted to go somewhere else, that I wanted to be in a big city. Uh, I think I remember the first, the first time I was like, this town is not big enough is when I was like four and I was watching the Winter Olympics and I was obsessed with all the ice skaters. And I was like, they must have grown up in cities with ice rinks. And I was just like, so upset that we didn't have an ice rink because the closest ice rink was like two hours away. And I was like, I cannot believe my parents chose to raise me and my brother in a town without an ice <laughs> rink. Like the nerve. You're mad at your folks. <laughs> rural, yeah. And so I was like, I want to live in a city. And so from like a really young age, I was like, I don't care what city it is, but I want like a city that people respect. That's like a big place. So I kind of just always had that drive of like, you know, I felt like I was, I was like too big of a fish for the pond that I had been born into. Is your, you mentioned an older brother. Is he like that? My older brother is so funny. His name is Brandon. He still lives very near the town that we grew up. He is an elementary school teacher he is obsessed with pop culture. So a lot of the like super fan stuff that I do, I think is because he was like showing me all of that basically from birth. Like he's the guy that goes to like comic cons and he has, so he's a teacher, but the other thing that he does, he's got this really cool like hobby shop that he runs that like he'll have artists come do autograph sessions or like athletes come do autograph sessions. And he has like, the biggest like he's probably like the top vinyl record seller in the entire state of Arkansas like, oh, wow. um, so he's really into pop culture but no I don't think he ever had the same drive to want to like live in a bigger city and have immediate access to things like I mean I remember I moved to New York City when I was 22 and it was so great because I could go to like four different shows a night if I wanted to I mean I could have gone to like 40 probably but like you know there there was just always something to do always like some new experience is there anything that you've ever been intimidated by like is there anything where, where you 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 stalled on doing something because it intimidated you yeah, finishing my book. So my book. And, and by the way, is this is this the first book? This, yeah, it's the okay. first book. So tell me about it. What what I mean, I think of someone like you, and my brain's like, well, she must not have been intimidated by anything. Some people can't move to New York because New York, I mean, the city alone. I lived in the city for a little while, but the city alone's very intimidating. The first time you come up from the, you know, the subway tunnels and you hear the noises and you smell the smells and people are walking past you so fast a lot of people run away from New York city. I mean, you were running towards those things. So what was it with the book? I think it was just wanting it to be perfect, like wanting it to be just right because the book's not really about me. I mean, it's got some stories from my past, obviously, but the book is for the readers. Like the Mm -hmm. book is about how anyone who picks it up, anyone who gives me the privilege of spending some time reading it can create super fans for themselves. And I think it was just a lot of pressure I was putting on myself, even more so than the publisher. Like it was really me putting this pressure on myself of like, 
it has to be perfect. It has to be just right. If someone is going to invest the time or the money to read this book, I want them to feel a transformation. Like I want them to remember a time before they were familiar with the model that I teach in the book, which I call the super model. Like I want them to remember like, oh man, I can't believe I used to do things this way before mm -hmm. I learned this better way. And do so you, I put you, a lot of pressure on myself for that, for sure. I kind of thought that might be what you, I mean, sure the pressure, is there, is there also like a legacy component to it? Like when you write a book, you can't take that back. You know, you didn't just meet someone, let's say it's not on video. You, you and I met in Nashville. If I'd have made a fool of myself, you would have forgotten me an hour later and it wouldn't have been that big a deal. But you write a book, that's not going anywhere. Yeah, there is a little bit of a component of that. And so when I was running my entertainment company, the super fan company, I made, I don't even know how many, like over a hundred commemorative packages for artists that were, you know, sometimes it was to launch an album. Sometimes it was for a fan club. Sometimes it was for a tour, but there was very often like a, like a printed component, like a book or a magazine or, um, something, something similar to that. And I think I kind of learned from doing that, that, you know, it, like nothing's ever going to be perfect. Like there's always going to be something you want to change. And that's, I think if you speak with any artist, they'll tell you the same thing. Like, an album's never done, you just release it. And like, that's the, that's the way the world gets to know it. But then you continue to tweak and evolve as you go on tour and you play the songs live or you re-record for a greatest hits album or re-release or whatever. So I think I had to just kind of look at the book the same way and say, you know, there are gonna be things, if there weren't things that I wanted to change six months later or a year later or three years later, it would mean I wasn't continuing to, learn and evolve and grow and so that would like be the true bummer is if i put it out and was like nothing i want to change still the same five years later it, getting started writing a book how long ago did you start oh man so <laughs> i had I, I thought i had like the best plan my so my second son was born in may of 2020 so in 2019 when i found out i was pregnant i was like all right i'm not going to travel from the third week of March of 2020 until like, you know, Labor Day or something. Yeah. I was like, that'll Lock get it down. Up. Baby, I'll stay at home. Right. Obviously had no idea what was coming. So the world shut down. I had like 11 gigs in the first quarter of 2020, all like on the road. Two of them canceled because of COVID, but the other nine I got to do. So, you know, and then obviously like the world shut down and I was definitely not in the headspace to write a book. Plus then I had my two-year-old at home with me because we pulled him out of school. So I ended up not getting to, to write the book in March and April of 2020, like I'd planned, but I had a lot of the outlining done. So I kind of like worked on it off and on. And then I got back to it full time. I would say like the middle of 2021 and finished, finished, <laughs> finished the first draft over the course of like a few months, turned it into the publisher. I had no idea what working with like a traditional publisher was like. Um, I've been through already seven rounds of revisions and edits and I'm waiting to get it back from the design team. I'm like a week away from seeing the full book. It's like 60,000 words, seeing it laid out with all the design because I'm such an experienced nerd. I'm printing all the books in four color. Like they're so fun to read. So, cause I want people who aren't necessarily like a book person to want to read this book. Like I didn't want it to look intimidating. I didn't want it to look like oh man, this is going to be hard work and give you a headache. I wanted it to be something fun that somebody was like, wow, this looks like something that I can read and will really enjoy. So like, for example, every chapter title is a song title. Mm. And most of the headings throughout the book are song titles. And it was just me trying to make it really fun and approachable. So even though I'm talking about customer experience, I'm using examples from pop culture that people are going to know. They're going to recognize the TV show or the movie or the superhero or the sports team or the brand that I'm using to help kind of teach some of these experience lessons. For, for someone like you, it, when you would get the revisions or the suggestions over and over again, was there ever a point where you just felt like you were over it already? Or were there ever a point where you felt like they were wrong 
Um, I'm curious about that back and forth a little bit. No, I don't think there was ever a point where I felt like I was over it. There were, there were like a couple things that I was like, no, I don't, I don't think this is quite right. And at that point, you just have to trust that like, you know, your audience better than anyone else. Right. Um, but for the most part, it was amazing. And especially uh, my copy editor, Melissa, like I've, I've told people, I don't know if I'll ever be as good at anything as Melissa Edwards is at copy editing books. Like she is just like a magic maker and so getting the opportunity to work with her was amazing because she pushed me to make the book so much better. You know, mm -hmm. she was like, like little things like, Hey, the story that you tell in chapter 17, like, what if we told it in chapter three? And what if we moved this chapter from here to here? And just, you know, like structural things like that, that I feel like she transformed it into something that I am so proud of and so excited for the world to see. So no, it was actually a really fun process. Are you one more quick question on that? Are, is there going to be an audible version? There will. Yeah. Or is There'll it going to be, be you version and a Kindle version? Is it going to be you? It's going to be me. Yep. Okay, good. All right. That, yeah. That's always is, the best. Everybody has told me like, you have to record your own audible because yeah. you can like you can infuse like extra stories and have like asides because oh, yeah. speaking is a very different medium than writing and there are things that work when you talk that won't work when somebody's reading your words mm -hmm. and vice versa so I think the audible I am recording it like a month from now but I think it's gonna be like a really fun experience well I'm excited for that my wife got me on audible not to promote one over the other but um as a gift I, I like to read, but, but I'm not good at it. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, I, I really do enjoy to reading, but I, I'm the guy kind of person that will read. I'll have to read the same thing five times to feel like it's sticking. Good readers have always told me that that's not how you read. You, 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 you're not going to take a test afterwards, but when, when I listen to something, I do pick it up differently. It's like my brain absorbs it. So um, I want the physical book, but I'm also probably going to listen to you talk me through the book as well. So, so when I was a little kid, um, one of the things I used to read at night was the Guinness book of world records. I used to just open it up to whatever page and, you know, you'd see like the longest fingernails or something crazy like that, or, you know, just the most random stuff. I, I read somewhere that you're now in that book, probably not when I was a little kid, but you're in that book now. So what, tell me that story. I did set a Guinness Book of World Records record. It is true. So I told you that I had the business plan for my company when I was when I was a kid, um, or a, a college student, which feels like a kid now. <laughs> so far removed. Um, I so for part of my undergraduate degree, I was part of this honors college where you had to do like a thesis capstone project to get your undergraduate honors. It was like an interdisciplinary studies minor or something. And you had to work on this capstone project for, for several semesters. And so mine was this deluxe package for an artist that I'd gone out on the road. I'd followed them around. I'd worked with their label to create this package. And then like five months before graduation, the band broke up. And I was like, well, what am I going to do to not have to either just lose this honor that I've been, you know, working, I'd, I'd taken like 20 something hours of credits, like to get this minor. So I didn't want to lose it, but I also didn't want to take the time to go back and um, like redo all the courses with something new because I was graduating in December because I knew I would have a better chance getting the job I wanted in the entertainment industry in January versus June. So anyway, I'm like, what am I going to do? I've got to come up with something like big and obnoxious to do. And it was right after Hurricane Katrina in mm. 2005. And so I was like, well, what if I do something for Hurricane Katrina victims? And so I'd always had it in my head that I wanted to set a Guinness World Record because like you, I used to love paging through, reading all the things. I have no athletic abilities. So like all of the fastest, highest. It wasn't you know, going to happen. All, yeah, like all of that was out. I was like, okay, I didn't want to do any of the gross ones. Plus I didn't have time to like throw <laughs> you know, the longest fingernails. Um, so I was just looking, 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 and I saw a record for the world's largest Christmas stocking. And I was like, I have a sewing machine. I bet I can do this. And so 
I got a bunch of buddies together and said, Hey, what if we create like a giant Christmas stocking and we fill it up with toys and we donate all those toys to kids in need. And they were like, yep, we're in whatever you need. So I went to like the, I don't think they call it home ec in college, but whatever they call like home ec in college um, and got help from like, you know, dozens of awesome kids that were like, yeah, we'll help you. So this stocking um, got my school to cover the cost of like all the material, got a ton of local sponsors who helped out with everything from like storage buildings to discounts on all the, the toys that we got. So together with my friends, I sewed a Christmas stocking out of like actual fleece material that was 54 feet tall and 27 feet from heel to toe. And like the, it was about 30 feet in diameter. Like it was just enormous. Uh, And we filled it up with, I think it was like 13 or 14,000 toys that we had collected like uh, as a community um, for kids in need. So that was my world record. That's insane. So where, where did you, did you take that somewhere? Did you, did you take it and present it? Like where, how do you move that around? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So the Guinness guy flew to the school. We had um, like a ballroom in the school where we did the ceremony because the stocking was like too big for anything other than the basketball court. And what, 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 what school, what school was this? The University of Central Arkansas in Got Cumberland, it. Arkansas. Got it. So then we took it, there was like a Toys for Tots event that was happening. So we took it to the Toys for Tots event so that they could like hang it up between two fire trucks. Like they had two ladder oh, trucks man. And like hung it, which was em- empty, obviously at that point. Um, and then we flew with it to Manhattan because the Today Show called and wanted us to be on the Today Show. And we were like, yeah, that sounds like fun. So we packaged it up. I'll never forget. We got to FedEx and it was like, it was going to be like $1,500 to overnight it. But we had NBC's like FedEx number. And I called the producer and I was like, I am so sorry. And you are never going to believe this, but it is $1,500. Do you want us to just cancel the trip? Should we not come? And she's like, no, it's fine. Just FedEx it. And I was like, <laughs> awesome. no, did you hear me? I said, it's $1,500. And she was like, yeah. Like, do you not have our FedEx? Account? You're just living on a different planet at that point with where their heads are and things like that. Yeah. It was, it's hilarious. It was like, it's funny. I was telling my husband the story the other day. So when I was 12, I won a contest and I got published in sports illustrated for kids. And I was like, so excited about it. And the thing that I think was like most exciting was they had like FedExed me a copy of the magazine proofs to approve. And it was the first time that anybody had ever like come to my house with a package to sign for. And I was like, this is a big deal. And then I got to make a collect phone call to New York to approve the proof. And I was so excited. Like I was, I think more excited about the FedEx package and the collect phone call um, than I was about being in Sports Illustrated for kids. I was like, mom, I get to call collect to New York city. That's so good. Into the, into the mind of a 12 year old. Right. And now you look back on that and see it so different. What a crazy story. So not only did you break a world, a Guinness world record, you also did something really good for the community. Like you're the perfect human being, Brittany. Like, what are we talking about (laughs) here? Don't get me wrong. It was completely, it was completely selfish. I was like, I have to graduate. And my undergraduate, my undergraduate major was PR. And so I was like, I know this is a great story. It's like college students do good. Like I knew that it was going to get national and media attention. I was, I mean, they covered it. Like I, you know, I made good friends with the AP reporters. So the AP there was there and had it on the wire and had a bunch of great video. And so, um, yeah, no, it was, it was calculated. It was good. I was happy that we were able to help kids, but don't get me wrong. It was, it was in no way selfless. Look, (laughs) altruism is a, is a tricky thing, right? That, that, That we, it's, I challenge you to find something that you do that's completely altruistic. And so I'm down with that. You, you, you did something good for <laughs> well, others and you, and you broke the world the, record. <laughs> yeah. Like this was nowhere near altruistic. This I don't know. 13,000 like, toys for kids that needed it. I'm sure those kids would have felt like it was pretty selfless. Anyway, we can get off of that topic. That That's awesome. I didn't know that that was the record. I knew there was, there was a record, but I didn't know that that was the record. Okay. I want, I'm, gonna set, I'm trying to set a new one for my book launch. So TBD. But so what I would have that this be? Crazy idea. It's like as crazy as the Christmas stocking. So we'll have to see if that one comes together or not. But you can't say what it is yet. 
Mm -mm. No, because I don't want somebody to listen and be like, no, I'm going to break that record. She said, Thomas, she sounds like a, we are are recording this. She sounds like a tech entrepreneur. (laughs) Don't let anybody know what we're doing. (laughs) You can't give away the secret sauce before you complete it. So. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny to like not tell because I'm that person who tells every entrepreneur, like, tell everybody about your idea. Like, tell everyone what you're doing because anyone you meet might be in a position to like really help you. But like, for this not record, this one, not this one. Yeah, good. Then don't say it because I don't want to get blamed for this being <laughs> recorded when I put it out. And then it's because Eric in that freaking podcast. Damn it, Eric. It was your fault. It's always Eric's fault. Okay. So um, I want to know about Shark Tank. So you, you, you get a phone call. I mean, did you think that I want to go on Shark Tank or did they hit you up first? How does that work? I never thought about it. I just, a producer read a story about me in, I think it was Forbes, like some magazine story and just called my desk one day and was like, Hey, are you Brittany? And I was like, yeah, Hey, what's up? And he was like, I'm producer for Shark Tank. Like, have you ever thought about being on the show? And I was like, no, but it sounds awesome. Like, what do I have to do? And so, yeah, we kind of got cast, which was a lot of fun because I've had friends who went through the audition process and it is like, no joke. You have to mm-hmm. do a lot to get picked. So we so were you got, really lucky to have a you, fast pass. You got to skip the line. So what was the, what was the business? What did you present? So it was my company, the super fan company, which okay. at the time when I had launched the company, it was called zine pack, like magazine pack. Um, because that was kind of the configuration that we were making for Walmart, but it was really just an entertainment agency that we pitched and we got offers from four of the five sharks. We did a deal on the show with two of them, although then we ended up like not actually doing that deal in real life. A lot of the deals kind of fall through once you get into the due diligence and see Mm -hmm. exactly how much they're asking for and exactly how they want things to go. So that was like the case with us. We were one of those that we were like, yeah, this is very expensive money. We could, if we needed the money, like we could get it from much better sources than this. And that, I guess, was also the difference between you and maybe others that would go through the audition stage. You know, you you already had something that you could see the vision. You had a path. You knew that you could raise capital in other ways with different sorts of valuation versus someone going and that's kind of at the end of their rope. They need cash. They need the investment. They maybe maybe the consult would have been a nice thing for you to have, but not worth the valuation. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, and Shark Tank is perfect for, for, for exactly that, for like garage entrepreneurs, um, inventors, people who came up with an idea that they're like, I have no idea what to do. Like I've got this idea and I need help versus, you know, I worked in distribution. I understood retail marketing and distribution better than probably even some of the sharks. And I say Mm -hmm. that like with like, full humility, but like I, you know, at that point I'd already been working with Walmart for a decade. It's funny. One of the sharks who invested was like, do you have a direct vendor number with Walmart? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, well, how much is your open to buy? And I was like, I mean, we've never got pushed back at all. Like that's, and he was like, okay, well, I've been trying to get a vendor number. Can I put some of my products through your company if we do this deal? And so, yeah, we like, we ended up not doing the deal. We, we're very fortunate that we were able to bootstrap the business. We had had lots of offers from VCs and investors over the years, but between having a really great, very generous uh, line of credit with American Express and the line of credit with our bank, we were we were always fine bankrolling it ourselves. Was there something that stood out about that experience above others? Somebody you met or experience that you got with the sharks positive or negative um no it was just really it was really fun to see like the behind the scenes of how it was made and to know how much goes into it like that it was my first time being on a tv show like a real tv show um i'd been around a lot of tv series and movies and i you know been on like news programs lots of times but i never really got to see from like pre-production to post-production like all of the things that go into it so that was a lot of fun who's your favorite shark um probably Lori was my favorite she was one of the ones that we did a deal with that we ended up like not doing a deal with but yeah she's great they're all so she was was it one shark that you did a deal with on the show or were there multiple that chipped in? Because Lori sometimes does the sort of partner deals with yeah, others. Yeah, it was a partner deal with Lori and Robert. 
Okay. Um, That's who you, she usually partners with. Damon and Kevin. Oh, you did? Yeah. Was Cuban on the show that day? He was, yeah. And he did not make us an offer. He was, not he was the only one that didn't. He like didn't believe that we were as successful as we were. Like he was like, oh, so he, we were in an agency and he was like, I want to know how much licensing you're paying to Gene Simmons to make a Kiss product. And I was like, zero dollars gene simmons paid me like you know i was explaining that it was like an agency model with the record labels and he was like that doesn't make any sense like why would katie perry pay you and i'm like because katie perry knows that i'm going to make a fucking awesome product <laughs> for her fans that's going to make her Brittany ton of Hodak, money. that's why oh i'm so, i'm sorry do you have do i have to read oh. that thomas <laughs> no no i said Heck i was no. just adding i was adding on to it because i'm Brittany hodak that's why she oh <laughs> I, I thought you were going to get on to me for using a bad word um no no yeah, never so he was never. like he was like i don't like i don't get it i'm he's like i know gene simmons like i can call him right now and ask him and i was like yeah like let's call him like i had to get his permission to use this product on the show so like he was very familiar with me we went back and forth many times on the creation of this product like let's call him right now um, how cool i wonder how often that happens. i mean it probably doesn't happen very often on that show where you, some because you know we see it as viewers people get called out and then that's all we see but i'd love to see that well you got called out and then you literally take out your cell phone and like here go call gene have a call here i'm texting him right now here's his answer yeah they didn't air that part which well, this i bet they really didn't funny. air that part <laughs> i i was like how can i like you know weigh this this what's the expression like weigh the scales my tip the scales in my favor i was like what right. can i do to make sure because i knew like people film for like an hour and then they show you know eight minutes or something and so i oh look at thomas with the screen there, to share. there yeah, it is it thank you thomas so i never stopped smiling for the whole hour like my co-founder and i actually practice which like we couldn't tell anybody we were on the show other than the people we had to clear rights from to use packages mm -hmm. so we were just like practicing smiling in meetings and people thought we were psychotic but my theory was if we never stop smiling they'll never get a close-up shot of us making like a weird face or like looking concerned so they won't be able to edit it with like lots of drama it'll have to be oh, like, so smart so we just like we looked crazy because we just never stopped smiling and it's harder <laughs> to do than you think like because it was we were in there for an hour so even when i was arguing with mark i was like no you're wrong like i'm right and you're wrong and i'm sure i look like a crazy person but it played out exactly the way we hoped which was that they weren't able to like edit it into anything where it looked like it was highly confrontational that is so smart because we watch these shows all the time, these reality type shows. And I always wonder what they just showed me. I guarantee that wasn't in chronolog chronological order. I guarantee that wasn't their response to what just happened. But I don't know. I mean, they're chopping this up because for the production quality. So how bad did your face hurt after that hour? Oh, it was like rough. It was like <laughs> hurt. Yeah. <laughs> But like I said, we practiced for a few weeks, like leading up to it. So that was, that was the plan the whole time. What, what, of all the things you've done and, um, as we start to kind of wrap it up and I'd love to have you back because man, I think of like so many I know, other things. I'm like, I feel bad. About. We didn't talk about anything for, for mortgage professionals or. Well, or, we can, or, we'll, let, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll be, we, we will do okay. that real quick. Okay, I'll but, come back. Although I think everything you talk about, I, mean, I don't know what business you would be in that you can't take something away from the experiences that you've had. And of course, the, the, um, the value that's going to be inside of your book. But, but of all the things you've done that us regular people will probably never get to do and the people we won't get to hang out with, what, what is for you the coolest thing that you think you've ever done? Like if you're going to tell one story, what's the story? Oh man, that is such a great question. Um, you know, I think for me, so like the whole concept I talk about in creating super fans is we're living in a world where everybody can have super fans. Like there is no objective measure of fame anymore, right? Like my five-year-old has no idea who any of the top grossing movie stars in the world are. But if you ask he or his friends about Ryan from YouTube, the kid that does the toy videos, like to him, that is a celebrity and creating super fans is about becoming 
a category of one to the people who need what it is that you do or sell, right? So this idea that you can create the same kind of loyal customers that celebrities have that are, you know, we might call them followers or fans or whatever, based on the industry that they're in. And so for me, the most incredible experiences have been with the ones that were people that I looked up to, that I idolized growing up. So getting to meet some of my favorite country music stars, getting to work with Toby Keith or getting to work with Garth or like, I mean, honestly, probably Dolly is the most iconic just because she is absolutely incredible. I've had the honor of working with her on a few occasions and getting to partner with her pretty closely on, on, on some stuff that we, we did after we did our first package together, which was for an album release. She was so pleased with it that she asked for a bunch of copies to give to all of her siblings, like, cause it was mm. sort of, it had a lot of like stuff about her life and she wanted copies for like everyone in her family. And so of course I was like, yes, how many do you want Dolly? You can have a million. Um, <laughs> and then she invited me to write the liner notes for an album release that she was doing that was her live Glastonbury performance and she was like would you consider writing the liner notes and I was like Dolly I will write your grocery list like whatever (laughs) you want like the answer is yes absolutely and she's always been such an inspiration to me you know like everybody else on the planet like I don't have to talk about well Dolly is great she is universally loved by everyone in the world but she is just fantastic and to have had the honor of getting to be in her presence multiple times and actually working with her has been you know it's it's always a highlight it's like always like it's always the best day of the month when I get to go do anything with Dolly so that's probably what I would say is my favorite no it's super cool um so let's talk for a minute about super fans. Let's talk about, you know, just your, 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 your teaching, your coaching, your concepts to support people in, in building brands and building awareness and doing it the right way. I'd also maybe love you to love for you to tie that into, and I don't know if I'm going to say this right. You were talking a little bit about how the idea of celebrity has changed and, and I, there's no way anybody could argue with that if they've been paying any attention to anything. Um, there's a part of me that also wonders, though, for young people that are on Instagram all the time or YouTube or TikTok, and and they're also trying to become that celebrity, right? They're not just interacting with their celebrities. Many times they're, they're, they're attempting to become that celebrity. Do you think that's helpful in the long term as they get into the business world, as, as, as maybe they need to become stronger at company branding, company awareness, or do you think it could be negatively impactful also because it teaches you maybe the wrong way to do things? Is anything I just said make any sense at all? I mean, can you tie that together? Yes, it makes a ton of sense. And especially with two little kids who, I mean, I see the way my four-year-old plays and he'll be in his room playing with Legos and he'll be like, and if you like this, be sure to subscribe to see more oh, of my videos. Wow. And he's like, he just, cause that's, you know, he's like play modeling what he sees. And I think, you know, we're all living through an experiment, right? This is like a, the largest ever real time social experience and experiment that we're all sort of co-creating together. Uh, what I do think is interesting is the concept of a brand has changed. Like unless you are Nike or Apple or some other brand whose logo can invoke an emotional response in someone, your brand is not what you say it is. Your brand is what customers think it is because of the interactions they have with your employees. Every single person that you hire is your brand. They, to someone, represent your brand. They may be the first, last, only person that that customer or prospect ever talks to, and they have no choice but to, I mean, they do have a choice, but most people don't make a choice other than to say like, oh, that person represents the brand, right? Like if they're a jerk, they think it's a company of jerks. Mm -hmm. If they're super nice, they think, wow, this company is so great and so accommodating. So every employee is the brand, and that is fascinating and also terrifying if you're that business leader charged with hiring and training and enabling for people to represent the brand as you want it to be represented. So I think a positive to everything that you described is like sometimes when I, when I work with people who have more life experience, they 
are very thrown by this idea of a personal brand. Like they sort of like cringe when you say it and they make a face and they're like, I don't have a personal brand. And it's like, well, you just told me that you're on LinkedIn and Facebook. So surprise you do. The question is not, do you have a personal brand? The question is, are you controlling it or is someone else controlling it? And I think kids who've grown up with having everything they want there in technology understand that much more innately. Like they don't see a disconnect between online and offline. It's just, it's all the world around them. And, you know, like when we were younger, if we wanted to get a song from the internet, we had to like wait for an hour. Like I go to, I go to, to Kazaa. To like <laughs> dial into AOL, you know, and like my kids can just ask the air to play any song that's ever right. existed. And they have instant access to it. So it's, you know, minds change and opinions change. And like, we got back from Florida a few weeks ago, we went to Orlando and my son all of a sudden was like very frustrated with automatic, with non-automatic doors. Like he was like, oh, another door I have to open myself. And I was like, <laughs> you're fine. Like you will make it through this hardship. But he was like, like we would go to the stores and, and he would say um, like, why don't you have a door that opens automatically? Don't you know that like, you don't have to make people open doors? Like there are doors that open themselves. And it was just so funny because he like, couldn't fathom that somebody would choose to not have an automatic door that opens on its own. And I think that's like such a unique snapshot of like, that is the mindset of, of people who grow up with things being easy that they're like, well, everything should be this easy. Why wouldn't you just make it easy? And I think the takeaway there for customer experience is you have to innovate before maybe you're comfortable doing it because if you don't, someone else will, and your customers will deflect to a competitor who makes things easier, simpler, more convenient, more clear, unless you have such an amazing relationship with them that they're going to stick it out with you, even though it's harder, even though it takes longer, even though, you know, it's not as easy and they can't do it from an app. So, you know, it's kind of like you're fighting the war on two fronts. Like you've got to make sure that you're innovating before your competitors and before you have to. And you also have to make sure that the experience of working with you is much more enjoyable than the experience of working with any of your competitors and whatever that means for what your business is. Do, do you talk much with companies that then end up as they grow in a much more difficult balancing act of which is more important the 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 stickiness of the thing or the relationship because the the relationship gets almost well I'm I'm not going to say impossible but it could, it gets very difficult to scale right um the 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 solution the tool the widget whatever it is that we're selling you can probably scale that at some level but the but the, that culture that relationship that trust so I'll give you a quick I won't say who, um, but there's a company that is in the tech space that, you know, years ago was similar to ours. You know, they had 30 plus employees. They were a nice company. They were profitable. Um, they were doing things really innovative, but they could really control the relationship and they were out in front of it. But then years later, they've grown. They're worth a ton of money and they're a well-known tech platform, but we were talking to their CEO. He asked me or their founder, he said, how big is your company? And I, and I said, do you, are you asking me for a dollar amount? Or are you asking me for people? He said, just people. And I said, we're about 30, 35. And he leaned into my ear and he said, don't grow. And I think what he was talking about though, was his disconnect now to the relationship. So how do you help companies or what are your thoughts just relative to balancing those two things? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard, right? And I think every founder experiences those growing pains of at some point, you can't have those one-to-one -one relationships with your customers like you used to because you've got so many things going on. And if you're not appropriately setting expectations, those customers oftentimes can feel slighted, right? Because they're like, wait, I used to deal directly with the CEO and now I'm having to deal with this VP or I'm having to deal with this project manager, like what's up with that? So part of it is expectation setting from day one. And part of it is scaling technology and automating the things that can be automated. Because when you automate 
some things you free up more of your people's time for the stuff that can't be automated for that human touch stuff that is not able to, you know, just be like put in, you know, press the right button, put them in the right filter. Um, so I think that being really strategic about your team's times, one of my pet peeves, um, and this is something that I see a lot in tech, it's not just tech, but it, it seems to happen a lot in tech is, you know, you've got your, your customer service team or your customer success team or your customer relationship team or whatever, that's doing a lot of your front lines with customers. And yet they don't always have a representative in the C-suite. There's not always a chief customer officer or a chief relationship officer or a chief experience officer. So there's all these layers between where the decisions are being made and where the actual day-to-day -day conversations with customers are happening. And that's where I see a lot of tech companies get in trouble as they grow, is they're, they're touting how customer-centric they are. They're talking about how great and innovative and outstanding they are. But then when you look at their meetings, it's like the CTO, uh, the CMO, the CRO, and none of them are talking day-to-day with customers mm -hmm. or with the people who are actually charged with the success and retention and happiness of their customer base. And so that's a problem that I've seen over and over again, like when tech companies bring me in to consult or speak or ask for, for me to sort of like unravel when they're like, I have no idea what, what went wrong. And I'm like, I think I've got a pretty good idea of what went wrong, but let's like back it up in the customer history and, or in, in the company history and look at it. And that's, um, it's like sometimes we forget that the reason any of us has a job doing what we do are our customers. And we should always be unfailingly customer centric because if we don't put what's best for our customers at the heart of every single decision, we will ultimately fail, right? Like we will not be as successful as we could be. And a lot of companies sort of justify their decisions it's like oh in the long run this will be great for the customers or like oh this is going to be so perfect for those customers that we want but you should never do something that you know is at the expense of the customers you have for hypothetical customers you're hoping to serve in the future that's uh, super well said um okay i want to tie it up but one quick question on your speaking is, is it, do you speak across all industries? I do. Yeah. So customer experience is pretty universal. I always like to say experience is everything and everything is experience. There is not a single product or service company on this planet that would not be very well served to think about how to improve their customer experience. So I speak to all kinds of industries. And that's kind of what I thought. And then talk, talk about your book one more time. What's the name of the book? When's it coming out? The book is called Creating Superfans, How to Turn Your Customers into Lifelong Advocates. You can pre-order it now and it'll be in stores in January. And if anybody listening wants to check out copies for their whole team, you can go to brittanyhodak.com slash bulk. I've got all kinds of offers where I bundle webinars and training programs and speaking gigs and everything else with bulk copies of the book. And you can save up to 40% off the sticker price. I love it. I'm excited. I'm excited to check it out. Super super appreciative because uh, you and I don't know each other. I mean, we've met, we met for three or four minutes and um, really appreciative that you were willing to come on and hang with us for a few minutes. And I hope we talk often. I hope I see you at other events. Um, you know, we well, only we're friends now. So like I, I, okay, good. I, we're I, done. I, I skipped a part of getting consent. I just like decided for all of us that we're friends now. So we will get to talk a lot. And next time I want to, I want to hear your life story. I feel like you were very generous with your time and let me talk about. Let's, me let's time. do it. We'll flip the script. Although, can we let some time pass? Because I can't compete with some of your stories, Brittany. Like we need to disconnect all of your killer stories from my killer stories about how I once scored the winning goal in soccer when I was 10. Like, I don't think anybody cares about it. I'm just kidding. I care. That is <laughs> actually okay. it never goal of a very exciting life. Go and then we'll come back stuff off your bucket list and then tell me about it. And then we'll come back, hang out for just a second <laughs> after we, after we stop the record button, um, hang out for just a sec, but Brittany, thank you for coming on the walk podcast. Everybody, anybody that's listening, you know, we're going to chop this up and send it out in a lot of different ways. Um, highly encourage you to check out Brittany's website or book. Um, I can promise you my team will be checking it out for sure. And Brittany, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on the walk podcast. Thanks for having me, Eric. It was so fun. You got it. Bye.